Welcome, guys, to Pounding the Table, Ask Me Anything session. Dominic Rinaldi here. Uh, we have one of our newest pounders, Nat Haruni. And Nat has over almost 10,000 followers uh, on Twitter and really known for his skill sets in genomics. So I'm going to let Nat introduce himself. And this is going to be an Ask Me Anything session where I get to pick his brain on genomics, genomic stocks, the science, and really help you guys understand what's going on in the world of gene sequencing and genomics. Hey, Nat. Yeah, thank you, Dom. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to have a chat about, you know, different genomics topics tonight. Um, I've always been a big fan of you, by the way. So before we actually became friends, I used to follow your material all the time. Dom is an, is an incredible speaker. So if you guys don't follow him yet, go ahead and shoot him a follow. You'll really enjoy, enjoy his material. Um, I tend to, you know, stay on the biotech side of things. I don't really do like tech, software, things like that. Um, but yeah, you're committed to it too. I asked you about doing some different talks and you're like, this is really my focus is on genomics. So I think that's why you have so many follows and it's also such a difficult area to really understand. Um, hence why we're doing this. Cause I want to, I know I'll learn a lot through this session. Um, so the first thing is just tell us a little bit about you as a person, how you got started investing and, and what you do for a living. So I'm a first year resident optometrist. Um, so typically the things that I see every day is like glaucoma management, uh, chronic dry eye. We do refractive surgeries. So things like PRK, LASIK, LASIK, smile. Um, so we see a lot of that day in and day out. Um, obviously just normal refractions. Um, and how long have I been in invest? How, how long have I been investing? Um, I would say like Probably my love for investing started around my junior year, senior year of college. And uh, that's when I was an undergrad biology major. Um, and interesting enough, I think my love for investing took off when I first learned about CRISPR and like CRISPR technology, CRISPR Cas9. Um, I think it was either in my junior year or, or senior year of college that uh, I took a 300 level genomics course. and. It's funny, I never really, I was never really passionate about genes or genetics at all. Um, but we started learning about this new technology. It was very early, it was in the very early stages. So at this point, it was probably about 2016, 2017 when I was a student. This technology uh, that came out of Jennifer Doudna's lab called CRISPR Cas9, I believe came out in somewhere around 2013. So it was around three years old at the time. And I would learn, they would teach us in this course that like now we have this ability to use CRISPR Cas9 to essentially edit the genome of not just plants and things like that, but we can actually go into the human genome and make specific edits, you know, possibly to pursue therapeutics and, you know, try and make advancements in cancer and things like that. And it's important to, it's important to state that CRISPR Cas9 was not the first technology to go uh, try and, and and pursue this gene editing technology. It wasn't the first gene editing technology to come about. So we had Talon, which is spelled T-A-L-E-N. And we had Zinc Finger, which uh, the short, short way of spelling is Z-F-N, Zinc Finger. And the problem with those prior to technologies was that they're very expensive. They're not, they're not really scalable. So if you wanna compare Zinc Finger and Talon to CRISPR-Cas9, if you want to change a specific nucleotide and what a nucleotide is, just a single letter in a gene or in the genome, just one letter. So we have, uh, we have A, T, G, and C. So if you want to switch like just a single nucleotide with CRISPR, it costs about $30. And if you're to use zinc finger or talon, it costs about anywhere from hundreds to thousands of dollars. So it was funny because I would leave class and instead of going to study my, uh, instead of going to study my slides, I would go study like CRISPR and how scalable this thing really could be. And is it worth the investment? Um, so yeah, that's where my passion started. And I, really, I've just been studying it ever since. I've been reading about it nonstop. And to this day, I love to read about it. It was really expensive back then too, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, I know we're coming down with gene sequ sequencing being more affordable. We're going to see the compute help, you know, support that. Uh, during 2013, even, I don't think we had the 
full genome, fully sequenced, right? I think that was just recently that that was announced that we actually have the entire human genome. The now. entire genome, right. Yeah. Just a couple months ago, I believe, yeah. Now, uh, I know we have these other questions I want to get to, but it actually really brings up a question of CRISPR-Cas9 and, and Jennifer Dowda. Uh, there's other companies that are in this space that she's related to. So can you maybe help us understand the confusion that a new investor who maybe is interested in this space or just learning between Editas Medicine, CRISPR-Cas9, Intellia Therapeutics, they're all kind of coming through that same uh, creator with Jennifer and her team to some degree. Would you say that and, and kind of them being involved with all those different companies? Because it gets confusing. Right, for sure. It's really important to kind of understand the foundational science. So the foundational science is is CRISPR. So what is CRISPR? CRISPR is a guide RNA strand. And the guide RNA strand is sort of just like a navigation vehicle. So it takes you to the point of the genome that you need to get to. So that's the guide RNA. And you mix it with a CAS. And so what is a CAS? CAS is sort of like a scissor that makes a cut in the genome. So your guide RNA takes the scissor and the scissor makes the cut in the genome. And then you get the edit, the, the edit that, you, that you're pursuing. So What's, what differentiates between the companies is understanding how they use the, the CRISPR complex, like how are they using the CAS? So are you using CAS9? Are you using CAS12? Are you using CAS5? So there's, total, there's a, a bunch of All different CAS nucleases. Then uh, are using CRISPR, right? Right. But what CRISPR is, is just a guide RNA with a, 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 it's a complex of a guide RNA, which is the navigation vehicle with a CAS and a CAS is a scissor. So they all have like a different combination of a guide and a different combination of a CAS. And uh, they also leverage different, um, um, they leverage different ways in which the DNA repairs itself. So there's, they all don't, the DNA doesn't always repair the same um, between all these companies. So I'd like to think as like Editas, uh, medicine, CRISPR therapeutics, Intellia as the first generation CRISPR companies. And so for the most part, it, it, it's not, this is a very broad, I'm painting this with a broad brush, but it's not totally true, but those companies leverage CRISPR Cas9. That's the complex. They use a guide RNA with a Cas9. It takes you to the point of the genome and you're not necessarily like when people think gene editing, you think that you're making a cut and then you're like pasting your own uh, template DNA. That's not really what's happening in first generation CRISPR. That was always the goal, but it was always sort of hard to get it to do that. So what we did with first generation DNA is we would go and target like certain um, conditions, for example, sickle cell, where if you have a certain mutation in a letter where the A and the T are switched, if you... Uh, you can target it one of two, you could target it in two ways. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty tonight, but you can understand that from a fundamental perspective, if the red blood cells, which carry oxygen, oxygen throughout the body, um, if your red blood cells become sickle or moon shaped, and they're not the spherical like disc shape that you need them to be, you're not carrying oxygen to your target organs the way that you need them to, to, to get there. So what you can do is that even if somebody has a sickle cell mutation in the genome, you can sort of make up for it by uh, increasing fetal hemoglobin in the body, which is a, essentially is a different gene. But if you turn that gene on back in adults, because it's fetal hemoglobin, it's not adult hemoglobin. So if you turn that gene back on in adults, fetal hemoglobin is super, super powerful. It, you can, it has the ability to, carry more oxygen than adult hemoglobin. So if you turn it back on, you can sort of make up for the deficiency of, of red blood cell or red blood cell and oxygen um, carrying ability in the body. So that's one way that they do it. So they're technically not fixing the actual mutation. They're sort of just turning on a different gene that can make up for that it mutation. It have to be very precise, right? Like this is one of the things that why Jennifer and team kind of went after sickle cell was that uh, it didn't have to be exactly to the point in the right precision where you could get away if it's cut wrong, you're still helping with uh, sickle cell and turning on that fetal uh, hemoglobin. I remember hearing that on one of the podcasts that uh, 
that's why they chose this disease to go after because the technology really fit uh, to really kind of go after that and cure that quicker than anything else. Is that a fair statement? Well, you always want precision. I guess I would never say that precision doesn't matter. It definitely matters. You never want to make an off target. So making a cut in part of the genome where you don't intend to make it. So the way that they make these first generation edits is that they, they create something called a knockout. And a knockout is sort of like silencing or hushing a gene that um, you want either expressed or you don't want it expressed. So you're not really placing a gene into the genome or, or, you know, or cutting and then putting in a template of your choice. That's more second generation, third generation CRISPR. These are more like knockouts where you're silencing or activate. Most of the time you're knocking out. You're, you, you're, 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 it's exactly what it sounds like. You're knocking out a gene. And so in this scenario, you're knocking out a gene that shuts off the fetal hemoglobin. So if you knock it out, the fetal hemoglobin remains on. So it's sort of complex to understand, but that's the way they're going about it. 